I would like to invite up now Dr. J. Daniel, who is a, uh, would you say you're an optician? Uh, kind of an engineer, I guess. An engineer yeah. at Tinsley Optical. And uh, Tinsley is a, uh, uh, a one of our local Bay Area companies here. Yeah. And he's going to talk about a very interesting use of Brilliant that they've been involved in over the past few years. All right. Well, thank you Great. very much. Thank you, everybody. OK, let's see if I can make this work. There it goes. Yeah, maybe not. Okay. OK, all right. So um, I have a fun job. And the reason I have a fun job is that we get to build a lot of mirrors that NASA uses for its various missions. And so just to, to steal your, your thunder there, Ron, we made the mirrors for the James Webb Space Telescope, which is all getting put together right now um, in, uh, down in Goddard and over in Goddard and on the East Coast and also down in, in Huntsville and in Houston. So I'll talk a lot about that as we go forward. But I thought I would also talk about some of the other, um, you know, big mirror projects we've worked on over the last uh, 25 years and talk a little bit about the material. So I'll spend some time talking about um, why Brilliant is interesting and you've already seen a lot of that information, um, but also talk about some other materials and how as sort of a, a mirror manufacturer, um, why we care about certain properties of different, of different uh, materials. Okay. Okay, so first of all, again, I have a lot of fun doing my job. Um, I get to work with a lot of really interesting people. Um, as we build these different instruments. A lot of different scientists from different institutes all over the world, they come to Tinsley and, and work, with, work with us to make mirrors. So I'm using all their slides. So anyway, I wanted to give these folks credit. Um, so you see a, a big bunch of lists there. Jerry Nelson is uh, one of my favorite scientists who um, was at UCSC and, and was the architect of the, uh, the big segmented telescopes that are in Mauna Kea. We're actually in the process right now of getting ready to build a really big telescope. And, Maybe at the end, if I have time, I'll talk a little bit about that, okay? Okay, so we make optics at Tinsley. So this, this building right here, I don't think you can see the dot. This right here, that's our original building that was on uh, right down near the waterfront in Berkeley. That picture's from 1926. So we've been making optics in the Bay Area for a really long time. Um, uh, Clayton Tinsley was actually a Galileo High School science teacher and then had this side business making uh, kit telescopes for amateur astronomers and there's these old magazines that have these ads from, uh, from Tinsley Telescope and Instrument Company. But as you can see we make a lot of other optics at Tinsley. These are some examples of some projects over the last uh, 10 or 15 years. And you can see down here these are made out of a, a, a glassy, a zero CTE, a, a low thermal expansion coefficient glassy material. These, we called those QuickBird at the time. Um, you know them as the Google Earth satellites. They're the ones that take the pictures of your houses that you look when you go on to uh, Google Earth. Um, that's an interesting material right there. That's actually polysilicon. That's a bunch of silicon crystals. That's a, that's a big part. That thing's about that big around. And uh, it's used in, in photolithography equipment, the equipment that you use to print mi microprocessors and, and memory, and all, it's all part of the digital you know, world we live in now. And so that's a, an optic we make. That's actually the same material that solar cells get made out of too, is polysilicon. It comes in these big giant chunks that, uh, that are cast and grown. And that's why we can get a big part like that to make a big mirror like that. So there's a couple of, I picked out a couple of optics that are made out of beryllium. So that's a, that's a beryllium primary mirror. That was for the Spitzer Space Telescope. If you, guys, if you guys know astronomy, you know the Spitzer Space Telescope. Spitzer is sort of the, the big infrared observatory, which, we, which was prior to the James Webb, which is going to launch in a few years here. So we made that optic right there. That's bare beryllium. It's about that big, about 850 millimeters across. This is, a, um, this is a, an optic that goes into a UAV, flies around at very, very high altitudes, much higher than commercial airliners, and is used as sort of a strategic reconnaissance. It sits in a gimbal and it flips back and forth really fast. And the stiffness of beryllium is important because it doesn't deform as it's modulating back and forth, looking down as it flies across the ground. Um, and then we also made these segments in the Keck telescope. So this is one of the two Keck telescopes. You can see, if you look really carefully, there's a person in the middle there. So that's 10 meters across. And it's also made out of a glassy material, a low uh, coefficient of thermal expansion glassy material. OK? So that gives you some example of the things we do. OK, so you know, we're really, as, as 
as engineers and scientists and opticians who make optics, we're really kind of agnostic about the material we use. I mean, beryllium is a really interesting material for its properties, but we make, we make optics out of lots of different stuff depending upon the application. So here's some examples. Um, here's, a, uh, here's a mirror that's in a weather satellite, and that's made out of that same kind of material that goes into the Google Earth satellites. It's, you know, this is the thing that shows you your, your, your pictures of your hurricanes and, and uh, unfortunately in California it shows you pictures of no clouds um, over the state for the last uh, 30 days. Um, here's a, a bunch of um, optical glass in a telescope assembly. This goes into a, a telescope that surveys the night sky every night, basically paints the sky and looks for asteroids and things like that. Um, here's a silicon carbide optic that, um, is, that is also a very stiff material and often is a competitor for beryllium. Okay, so I thought maybe we'd talk about a couple of projects we've worked on. This is a, a small sample and maybe some interesting stories about, about optics and some of the things you've heard about them in the past. Okay, so I don't know how many folks have heard the Hubble story about how the Hubble telescope was manufactured and then launched and then we found out that it was, that it had a very fuzzy image, it had the optical prescription was incorrect. So, uh, this is a little bit technical, but I thought maybe the audience would like to hear how that actually happened. Because a, a lot of folks don't know exactly how that really happened. So um, I know there's a couple of Tinsley engineers in the audience. A couple of them I tried to talk into giving this talk, Shane over here. Um, and so she's going to follow me when I, when I tell you about the story about how this actually happened. So when you make an optic, you often, you build something called an optical test, which measures the shape of the optic you're making, okay? And so this is the optical components that were, oop, got that, hit, hit the wrong button, sorry. Let's go back. This is the optical corrector, the null, what we call a null corrector, that was used to make the Hubble primary mirror. So what's in here? There's, um, the, I don't show you in the image, there's the interferometer, if people know what interferometers are, they're, they're um, instruments that use light to measure the shape of surfaces. Um, Interferometers up in this area. This is just a spherical mirror. This is a mirror who has a spherical curve. This is another mirror that has a spherical curve. And then there's a, 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 a field lens down here. So these three optical elements produce a, a wavefront of light, which should, if, you, if they're arranged correctly, should actually return a null signal when you have the right shape of the Hubble primary mirror. And so the challenge with setting up this null corrector is you have to set the spacings between all these various components relatively precisely. So here's what went wrong when they made the Hubble primary mirror. So we, those folks used what are called gauge rods, these rods right here, to set the spacings. And essentially what you do is for that sphere, you can see the rays here of light come to a focus at that point, and the, and the spacings between the focuses were set with these gauge rods, okay? So here's what actually what happened. This is so, it's so simple that it's really tragic. But, um, but here's what happened is they had these caps that were on the end of the gauge rods and they put those caps on there because they didn't want to damage the end of the gauge rods while you're handling it during setup. And then what happened was, here's a picture of the cap, the offending cap from the Hubble. And actually some of the anodized flaked off of the, the cap on the top. And instead of when they set that spacing in the test, instead of having the light hit the end of the rod, it hit the top of the cap. And so there was a 1.3 millimeter spacing error, and that's what caused the Hubble mirror to be ground to an incorrect shape. Okay. Okay, so this is, I mean, this is sort of a, it's sort of a tragic story. So, you know, Perkin and Elmer, Perkin Elmer was the company where this mirror was, this optic was being manufactured. And you know, Perkin and Elmer were a couple of guys who started an optics company in their garage in Brooklyn back in the night, late 1930s. And I like to think of them as Hewlett and Packard. I mean, they used to have barbecues in, their ba in, the, ba in the back of their house, of the garage where they started this company for the employees and hand out the checks. It just sounds just like HP. It was just the same kind of company. And they got very, very big and got to do these big government programs and all these sorts of, they had all kinds of political pressures. And with this particular project, they had gotten very far, far behind schedule and over budget. And part of the reason was the optical test was telling them to grind all this extra material away. And so they have to keep grinding and grinding and it was taking much longer than they expected it to take. Um, but even worse than that, 
they had three different independent tests. And you can see up here, there was those two, that null test I showed you, another null test and a mechanical way of measuring the shape of the mirror. So two of those three tests told them the mirror was the wrong shape. In fact, it told them the mirror was exactly the shape that they ended up with before they launched it. And they were under so much pressure, they decided to launch the Hubble anyway. So they launched it. You know, the cap comes off, the, the sun shield comes open. They get this very um, fuzzy image, and all oh, hell breaks loose. So, um, so that's where Tinsley got involved a lot with NASA back in the 19, late 1980s and into the 1990s. Um, NASA ran a, a round robin competition, said, went to all these different companies, said, can you make these, null, these corrector optics, these null optics that will fix the eyesight, basically in the back side of the thing. And so we won that competition, and that's how we kind of got involved with Hubble. So here's kind of one of the glory, glory uh, shots from the Hubble. If you look up at the Big Dipper, the Hubble is, is, is a telescope, has a very tiny field of view. You sort of like, if you were to hold like a pin out at the end of your arm and look, that's literally the area of the sky the Hubble is seeing. It's a very narrow field of view instrument. Um, so this is the example from the deep field image, what they call the deep field and the ultra deep field from the Hubble. And they point at the Hubble at that little point in the sky right there. And with the corrective optics, you can see this amazing stuff. So here's, a, here's an example of the deep field. You see all these galaxies. And with even a, a further on image, they were able to literally see back to within about a billion years after the Big Bang started. So kind of neat. OK. All right, so I want to talk about another project that we, we were involved with a few years ago. You know, this, I know when you think about you know, space exploration, sometimes it seems kind of boring, but there is so much diversity, even in our own solar system. And it's frustrating sometimes when you look out at some of the pictures of the Hubble, it's just a bunch of dots and lights and all that. But the more we, we learn, the better the instruments we build, the more fascinating stuff that we can see. And you can see all the diversity and all the interest just in our one solar system here. And now we're starting to build the instruments to probe other solar systems. So one of our first projects here to, to really start looking at solar systems outside of our own is the, is the Kepler um, mission here. And unfortunately, we all know the gyroscopes and the Kepler failed, and they're trying to figure out how to make it work right now. But there's a, this made a lot of tremendous data. So here's one of our engineers, uh, Bridget. She's testing one of the optical elements in the Kepler. This is an optical glass. This optical element ends up sitting about right here in the telescope. Um, and we have found a lot of planets with this instrument. So it does that by looking for these things called transits. So here's an ex uh, a graphic of what you know, a transit with Jupiter passing in front of the sun would look like. And here's a, a transit of what Earth passing in front of the sun would look like. And the, the instrument, the, the telescope, basically looks for these dimming events. So this was launched in March of 2009. And after 20 months, um, they, the, uh, the folks down at NASA AIM started to put out these, these plots of, all these, of, how the, the, um, of what the, the stars they found that had transits and kind of what they would look like relative to our own. So in this thing here, this is a, I love this image here. So you can see that there is uh, you know, some colder stars. You know, the sun here is about a 5,800 degree Kelvin uh, 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 star. And there's obviously hotter stars and cooler stars, and they, get, they showed all these different planets, and these are candidates really, They're not, some of them are not confirmed at this point in time, of what the, the different um, planets transiting in front of their respective stars look like. So this was an interesting system. This was one of the, the first planetary systems where we saw a lot of planets, you know, uh, a large number of planets going around um, its sun. This is uh, what's called Kepler-11. You can kind of see how it scales down onto our solar system down here below. Here's our sun with Mercury and the Venus orbit. And these are all very large, very, very hot planets that um, orbit very close and go around in just a few days. And those were the types of systems they found initially. This is, um, obviously everybody wants to find Earth-like planets, want to find these Goldilocks planets. This was one of the first ones they thought they found. And it sort of is a object lesson for science because uh, after another year or two, they realize that this doesn't really exist. So 
Um, but we thought this, this Gleazy 581, which is only 12 light years away, which is pretty close, um, was a strong candidate for a Goldilocks planet. But um, since this time, they found many other um, Goldilocks planets that they actually have confirmed. Okay, so using transiting methods from the ground, before Kepler launched in 2009, these, this is a plot of um, the, um, the size relative to Earth. So if we had found a transiting planet that was the same size as Earth, you'd have a one here. And then this is how, how frequently they go around their sun. So you know, we're out here, Earth is out here at 300 and something days. And then uh, you know, some of these are going around their star every day, every 10 days, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, even after nine months, you can see most of the, the, the planets that were found have some pretty short orbits, you know, pretty short years, and they're a little bit bigger because they're closer and spin pretty quickly. So that was after nine months of data. And then here is after about uh, 22 months of data. So really starting to fill out the whole, the whole space here. Um, another way to look at the, the planets is to look at how warm they are. And so now you can see down here on the uh, x-axis here, the actual predicted temperature of the planets that they found. And you can see many of them are very, very hot. So obviously 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit is um, a little warm, okay? So I uh, don't like those. And we are looking for, what we're really obviously interested in is, is the science of all this, but also looking for what we call these Goldilocks planets, so the ones that really capture the imagination. And you can see that, you know, at, by the time the, the, the reaction wheel stopped working and they had analyzed most of the data, that um, we had actually gotten ourselves up to uh, 4,200 uh, planet candidates and 268 um, Goldilocks type planets. So really was neat to be able to um, contribute to this, this um, science. Um, Okay, so you looking here? Okay, all right, so now that's a little bit of history. Now we'll talk about James Webb. So James Webb is going to launch, we think, in 2018. And I really like this picture because they, this, has been off, this has been up in Manhattan. This is a model of the James Webb Space Telescope. And it gives you a sense of the, the scale of the observatory. You can see the sun shield here. It's about as big as a tennis court. Here's all the various um, uh, mirrors that go into the, the main uh, primary mirror. And here's a, a team of the scientists at Goddard working on the instrument. OK, so what do we want to do with James Webb? So don't want to read this to you, but here is a list of some of the science objectives of Webb. There's a number of other objectives, but of some of the really major things that we want to do with Webb, um, understand the, real, the origin, the evolution of the universe, um, the James, James Webb's going to be able to look back a long way um, in time and be able to do that. Try to get a handle on, by doing that, try to get a handle on this, these whole questions of dark energy and dark matter. A lot of observations you can make with this telescope that we can't make today that will help us understand those types of things. And then also learn about uh, planet and star formation. Um, because it's an infrared instrument, it has a lot of unique abilities. Okay, so. So now we'll start to get into why is beryllium interesting, all right, for this, for this observatory. So with, um, if you want to look at as far back in time, as early in the universe as you possibly can, you have to look at objects that are very, very far away and very, very faint. And so there's this, uh, there's this um, principle called the Doppler shift, um, which, uh, which causes the light from these objects that are very, very old and very, very far away to be very are shifted relative to the visible. So stars mostly put out light in the visible and the infrared. That's where most of their energy comes out. And then for these stars that are very, very far away, that are from the very early origins of the universe, that light is literally shifted all the way to about 25 to 30 microns. Whereas visible light, as you can see here, is in sort of this half micron to one micron range. So you see kind of this graphic that explains that. So we. We need to look at these objects from space because those wavelengths don't really transmit to the atmosphere. So we can't build James Webb on the ground and look at these very, very highly redshifted objects. Um, the other reason um, to put it up in space is that at room temperature, everything glows at 25 and 30 micron wavelengths. So if you could look around this room 
with a pair of goggles on where you could see 25 to 30 microns, it would just be all washed out. So you have to be very, everything has to be very, very cold to detect those sorts of wavelengths. So that starts to get into why beryllium is, in, but beryllium is an interesting material to build this type of telescope out of. So some of the, some of the qualities are um, you need this large collecting aperture. You have this big mirror. It's six meters across. Um, beryllium, um, one of the really interesting properties of it is it has, it, at cryogenic temperatures, at these very cold temperatures, 20 Kelvin, 40 Kelvin, which is where this observatory is going to operate, um, it, it doesn't expand or contract. So like a metal, normally when you warm it up, it'll get longer. And at cryogenic temperatures, beryllium has this property where it doesn't expand as you heat it and cool it. So it's able to withstand these thermal gradients and maintain its shape. It's a really interesting property. Beryllium is almost a magical material in that regard. And then you can see here in the, in the telescope, we have this big sun shield, which keeps everything very cool. Okay, And so we'll be able to see these very faint objects. Okay, So these are some images from the Spitzer Space Telescope. Obviously, Webb is not up yet. Um, so everybody knows Orion's belt, you know, sort of around August, and you walk out at night and look up into the southern sky kind of high at between 10 o'clock and midnight, and you see Orion's belt up there. It's one of the really, really um, obvious constellations uh, you see at night. And it looks very different with visible light and with infrared light. So with infrared light, at those long wavelengths, it actually will go through dust. And so there's a lot of interstellar dust, and you can see a lot of things with infrared light you can't see with visible light. And so this gives you an example of that. This is a picture um, from the, the Spitzer of Orion's belt in infrared. So for those of us who want to really geek out here, this is a, this is a curve of the, the coefficient of thermal expansion of beryllium. You can see it's heading down to zero here at these cryogenic temperatures. Um, you know, here's an example. Here's a, one of the beryllium mirrors from James Webb on one of the optical mounts in our factory. Um, we've already talked about some of these, these properties. So beryllium is stiffer than steel, even at its mass. Um, it is very light. We saw this density property here. The other thing is it has a very high thermal conductivity. And the, the, and the most important property to us is this very low CTE down here. So you know, a lot of us think of ourselves as aerospace engineers. And we look at what are the properties about these different materials that make them good candidates for mirrors. So as you go up this way, you get really light and really stiff. As you go out this way, you get very thermally stable. And at cryogenic temperatures, beryllium has this property where it's just dramatically better than any other material you could potentially make things out of. And, and that's why we're so interested in it for these cryogenic applications. Okay. So here's some of uh, our colleagues here from Tinsley. So I see some smirks on the Tinsley engineers' faces. Here we're um, rubbing a mirror here. Now we've cleaned it. This is the actual, this is the tertiary mirror in an optical test. Here's the primary mirror in its optical test. That's a few years back. And we finished polishing all the mirrors in June of 2011. So we've been done for uh, four and a half years now, or four years about. Um, this is the size, oops. Let's go back. This is the size of the Hubble primary mirror. Um, it's about two and a half meters across. You can see a person here about five, five, five and a half feet tall, relatively speaking. This is scaled for the same size. So it really is quite a large mirror. If it were in this room, it, the primary room would almost fill this room up. It's, and it really helps us see these very faint objects. For those of us who are optical engineers, we, we use the xenophorograms to, to measure the shape. And you can see that we, we, uh, we, we got to about half of our spec down here um, in terms of our RMS figure error. There's the last, last segment rolling out. Um, I wish I had some really cool pictures of the whole telescope put together to show you here tonight. They're actually putting it together th this year. So at the end of 2015, you'll stop seeing pictures of the mirrors and you'll start seeing pictures of the mirrors all hung on this thing. It'll start to look like the real thing. And they're putting it together in NASA Goddard right now back in near Washington, D.C. So here are uh, six of the mirror segments. There's actually 18 segments in the primary mirror. You can see that they look like they're gold here, and it's because they put a gold coating on. And gold coating has very high reflectivity at these long infrared wavelengths. That's why we coat the mirrors with gold. Okay. So this next uh, slide, I hope, is a 
an animation of the telescope launching, and I'll talk to you a little bit about it. A friend of mine and I had a little fun putting it to music, so maybe you'll recognize this. So this is an animation from NASA. So the telescope actually is going to fly out to what's called the second Lagrange point, which is a point about a million miles it's out. The this is my friend Guacamole with his... Uh, These are the voyages of the James Webb Space Telescope. It's continuing missions to explore strange new worlds to seek out new life and new civilization, to boldly go where no one has gone before. So the Lagrange point's about a million miles out beyond the orbit of the Earth, uh, up beyond the Earth. And what's very interesting about that is a very, it's a very stable gravitational state. So the, the telescope's not going to have to do a lot of thrusting. But you can see here, here's the sun shield deploying out here after it, it comes out of a fairing rocket and it's doing this deployment as it's going from the or, you know, Earth orbit out to the Lagrange point. This, um, this telescope's kind of unusual in that regard in that um, a lot of telescopes that we launch for astronomical observations either go around the Earth like the Hubble or they trail away from the Earth like the Spitzer or the Kepler where they get farther away from the Earth every year in a trailing orbit around the Sun. So you see the secondary mirror is on a long armature and after and it's going to deploy as you see there. The, uh, the primary mirror is actually folded up because it has to fit into the fairing of the rocket and it will actually, um, these two pedals will actually deploy out and then we're going to uh, show you kind of an artist's rendition of where the telescope will be with respect to the Earth. So this is actually, as you all probably know, this distance from the Earth to the Sun is 83 million miles and then the telescope is out here another million miles. So it isn't as far away from the Sun as the Earth is. I mean, this isn't as far away from the Earth as the Earth is from the Sun. So you can see a picture of the Sun shield here. And this, the job of this is to shield the telescope from the Sun. This will run at about 30 Kelvin, so very, very cold. And that's needed again so that the observatory can see those very long wavelengths of infrared light without being washed out by all the surrounding radiation. Okay. That's it. Hey, thank you very much. You're welcome. So I have a couple of questions. I wanted to show, this is a, actually a piece of space hardware. This is what would have been a beryllium mirror. Mm -hmm. um, so if anybody wants to take a look at this, uh, you come on up. This would probably be a secondary mirror that light would reflect off of um, inside of the telescope. But fast, uh, that's a, a piece of the space hardware right there that's made out of beryllium. It's a fast steering mirror. It's a what? Fast steering mirror. A fast steering mirror. Yeah, it goes, it's... He knows. It, Just by looking at it. Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> um, <coughs> Sorry. No, it's excellent, excellent. Uh, but it's also very light. And one thing, it's interesting how um, you see beryllium as a low coefficient of expansion material and uh, a good optical surface, mm -hmm. whereas the guys that actually have to get this stuff off the Earth say, wow, we like this stuff because it's light and it's cheap to yeah. lift off the Earth. Yes. So yes. there's some, an aspect that I don't think you talk about. So you look at the backs of these things and you notice they've, they've actually milled out most of the material from the plate here as well, and I'm sure that's the same on the mirrors and the yeah, James those, Webb. Yeah, those James Webb mirrors that are about this big weigh about 40 pounds. So, I mean, you could, they, they're, you could pick them up with one. If they're very, you know, this very articulate, sort of very intricate structure, but you could pick them up with one hand. We don't pick them up because we might damage them, but they're incredibly light. You cause them to be lifted. Yes, we cause them to be lifted. So, another thing I wanted to mention to, for folks here who are at the museum uh, is that if you're interested in looking at yourself in a wavelength of light very similar to this at about 14 microns, uh -huh. if you go outside the webcast and make a right hand turn, just go around the corner, we have an infrared camera. Many of you may have seen it already, but you can look at yourself in this light. And what Jay was talking about is you're giving off this light here. And so if your cameras are giving off the light, it's really hard to detect it as well, which is why if you want to detect it, you have to chill it. And so yeah. that camera actually has a detector inside that's slightly chilled. So um, go around the corner there and take a look at the infrared camera. Uh, I want to remind everybody that uh, we are off next month and that we will come back in May for Boron. Uh, I'd like to thank Jay and Tinsley yeah. for participating today.
You know, an interesting factoid is that there are actually more stars that have a higher energy density in the infrared part of the spectrum relative to the visible. The sun is kind of a hot star, so it gives off more light in the visible relative to the infrared. So if we ever do find little green men, if they're from one of these cooler little stars. Green people. Little, oh, thank you, little green people, thank you. <laughs> then uh, they might actually see in the infrared because they might be adapted to see in the infrared where we're adapted to see in the visible. We'll have because to have that's the, much larger eyes. Well, uh, yeah, maybe. Made out of beryllium and gallium and yes. germanium and silicon. That's the germanium-based life. Yes, exactly. I um, also want to mention that, um, <laughs> want to also mention that uh, coming up uh, this coming Sunday, we have Full Spectrum Science. Also next Thursday night, we have Full Spectrum Science. We're going to talk this time about exponentials. And previous, before the Full Spectrum Science, next Thursday night, we're going to have the San Francisco Conservatory of Music uh, for the Full Spectrum Music section of our show from uh, 7 to Eight, I believe. No, no, 6.30 to 7.30. So please come back for that as well. We hope you enjoyed tonight. And if you have any questions, we'll take some questions uh, after we uh, close out here tonight. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.